we're here with Jared Edwards and Tyler Smith talking about uh, historic preservation in Hartford, in Connecticut, and in America. And I'm interested in how each of you got involved in this. It was such an interesting time when, uh, you know, in the 50s, everything was about new and the now and modernism and progress. How did that historicist seed get planted? And where were you at the time and what turned you on about it? I think my engagement came largely through architecture school and particularly under the influence of people like James Marston Fitch, who was a professor at Columbia at the time. That would have been 1964 to 68. And uh, he, he was one of the early advocates of an emerging vision of historic preservation that went far beyond uh, George Washington slept here structures. It was about uh, community, it was about how we build, it was about in environmental issues that were inherent to older building types. Blight removal program that operated under the disguise of urban renewal and the interstate highway program. Uh, those two forces at the Federal uh, Housing Act that uh, created housing for returning World War II veterans, but not in cities. It was all in the suburbs and all new. There was a huge dark cloud over all this was the war in Vietnam, inordinate uh, recruiting and drafting of minorities to fight that war, uh, and the systemic programs of blight removal uh, that was going on in the name of urban renewal. And Columbia was very much uh, a part of that acquisition of properties in and around Morningside Heights for, and they would evict the tenants and take control of them and gradually expand their, their, their facilities. They got permission to build a gymnasium for the use of Columbia in Morningside Park. In the spring of 1968, when the few black students, undergraduates in Columbia, uh, took over Hamilton Hall in protest of a, a whole series of civil rights issues, the architecture students said, we got some gripes too. And we struck, and right after that, uh, we formed a group of us, something called Urban Deadline. Uh, we did Vest Pocket Parks. In 1969, uh, the Citizen Union made us the most uh, significant architecture firm in the city of New York the previous year, Kevin Roach having got it for his Ford Foundation building. In 1964, of course, with the New York World's Fair, which was kind of the high water mark of Robert Moses and all that, yeah. and, and, and hadn't Jane Jacobs just written her seminal book about a couple of years earlier? So this early 60s is when these cultures clashed. Yeah. Well, the first year of architecture school, we went down to see Jane Jacobs, who's just published her book, and she let, there was five or six of us in a class with a professor, knocked on her door, she came out, and invited us into her kitchen, started talking, and said, come out here and look at this. She said, you see it's the street out there? Cars going back and forth, and, and who, who's in the street? These kids are playing stickball. And then she said, look around the corner there. There's a big cyclone fence and a basketball court that's completely empty. And she said, how come the kids are all playing in the street with everybody else, and they aren't even no one in basketball. She said, this is the ballet of the street. In a sense, modernism and preservation are almost at odds with each other. Were there different uh, schools of thought going on within the curriculum even? It's, and I met Jack Dollard in the summer of 63, and he was doing all this stuff in the North End. At the time, Columbia was uh, still rooted in its Beaux-Arts tradition. Right. right. And it was not a play. I mean, Philip Johnson, and they couldn't wait to get up to Yale. And all of a sudden, I've got a first-year professor, beginnings of a pushback on early modernism. It was called Team 10. Uh, it's all about Aldo Van Eyck. The next generation after the big big three, yeah. Gropius, yeah. Mies, and, and Corbu, who said, wait a minute here. You guys are missing the boat on the issue of community, social issues, and placemaking. Yes, I was part of a clique that was immersed in CM, uh, uh, Conference International Architects Modern, that was a, kind of a group of younger architects, uh, Aldo Van Eyck, uh, Smithsons, uh, Giancarlo De Carlo, who were challenging the old guard. Had the historic preservation program at Columbia started at that, by that point? It, it was the first year. 66, I think, was the first year, and uh, it was the outgrowth. I mean, Penn Station, 1963. Oh. Brilliant. Um, 
Venetian architect, Carlo Scarpa, he had accomplished some, some projects that incorporated medieval architecture, but he did, he modernized them. And his modernism was very strict and very um, hard-edged. It toned it way down so that you would go through these buildings and all the original Renaissance or medieval building parts were what were emphasized. But you realize that he had ingeniously inserted exit stairs and an elevator here and glass partitions without mullions sheets of glass but from masonry to masonry. It was something that was unheard of. Unheard of. And, and I felt that what Carlos Scarpa was saying is preservation is as modern as Mies. And why don't we introduce these elements in as invisibly as possible into our projects? And John Carlo De Carlo, who did all this work in Urbino under the same methodology of, of uh, and he spent his, most of his career just kind of fiddling with and introducing modern components into the, the wall city of Urbino. Uh, and, to and make it work as, it, as it a work. modern yeah, yeah. piece of um, composition. The, the inspiration when we started our office in 70, yeah. 77, um, to take a building, I think one of the first buildings we toyed with was, in fact, the state capitol. Was, you were the first, really, to be into historic preservation and interested in documenting existing conditions. You were the, held all the knowledge of historic preservation from Fred Ferguson to Happy and Perry in your head. And you come, uh, and one morning, Mr. Ferguson comes down to the office with smoke coming out of his ears because he sees he's going to lose this project, project for the state capitol. And one of our first early mistakes as naive young architects was Don Semino, who was the principal architect, and he hired us, and we thought, God, we're off and running. And, and as soon as he got what he wanted from us, which were Jared's existing condition drawings, said, bye guys, and left us, and for the next 30 years, he <laughs> was getting paid left and right to be the capital architect. Yeah. But that launched us, because in 1976, um, Howard Nannan, who was a young developer, hooked up with the Hartford Architecture Conservancy and did the first tax act project in the city of Hartford. The James Cold J. House. James Cold House. Which, oh. And no bank in Connecticut had ever lent money to a historic rehab. Yeah, yeah. And so, through social connections, Tyler and I lobbied Jim English who happened to be the president or the chairman of the Connecticut Bank and Trust Company. CBT stood, stepped up and gave Howard the necessary loan. And that the, uh, my Bible at the time was this book by Arthur Ziegler of the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation. Yeah. was doing this all this urban renewal of, of through a revolving fund of buying a house that was inhabited by blacks and Hispanics, getting them uh, loans and allowing them to stay in their residences and own them. And so with their large endowment, wouldn't the Connecticut Historical Society like to do this same thing? And one of the very first battles was uh, the Church of Good Shepherd. The steeple was listing and the, the Colts request was going to tear it down. It had originally been built on po wooden piles that were driven into the ground, and those wooden piles were largely wet because the, the air had flooded every year. Yeah. And, so they, and so when they built the dikes in 1941, piles started to dry, up, dry out and rot, and then all of a sudden this thing started to list. And Jack M.K. Davis cl claimed, and he kind of was, fell on his sword over this issue, and to that, that they weren't going to tear it down and they were going to spend it. He did, he came it. around, they did, they, yes. Here we are, it's the early 70s. Talk about ha Hartford Architecture Conservancy. What gave birth to that and when? It's going to be a meeting at the house of the Paganos. Paganos, because about doing something to save the Loomis Woolley House. And we kind of said, hey, what are we going to do about this? We better get organized. If we do, I mean, I was very plugged into some of the triumphs that. Preservation Society and Providence. Lou Adler read about him. 
Pioneer Square, the blue-haired so, yeah. ladies in Texas, so San Antonio. So we, we kind of got going. And I had had um, as chair of the board of the Mark Twain. It's this contextualization, of building buildings that respect and interact collegially with their environment. Maybe the most significant win for our success in getting the city of Hartford to redesignate South Green area from a urban renewal clearance project. A neighborhood restoration. And this was over 55 buildings. And the, and the other thing, and, uh, um, it was the availability of historic tax credit that became the vehicle that allowed all these to be financed. There, the threat of an executive order, 11593, that said funds cannot be used, federal funds cannot be used to desecrate a federally recognized landmark. I certainly remember um, hanging out the window room on the third floor of the Capitol, looking into the park up with the Corning Fountain down there. And Jim Connelly, who was the Speaker of the House, and Joe Lieberman, who was the Attorney General for the state, and I remember gesticulating with my arms saying, see, the highway is over there, and it's going to go right down in front of this building and right down to the pumping station at the other end in order to connect to I-91 South. And I think they both stood back and said, no way would we allow this to happen. That could highway department yeah. de-designated and gave up. Uh, and I think that wasn't formally pushed through until 1978 or something like that. The Congress Street development was going on in the early 80s. Yeah. The, 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 yes. What was the condition of those buildings when this started? I mean, were they... Not, not hopeless. No. I mean, and there was a combination of these wonderful Italian eight structures, the, the rather small three-story, yeah, yeah, and nice. then there were a bunch of perfect sixes. Uh, who who uh, owned uh, the all condemned owned, owned by the city of Hartford? They had oh, condemned all the clearance. It was supposed to be clear. They were going to destroy everything. Well, uh, why? We bought that building for ten thousand dollars, and then arranged. Actually, it was Chuck DeBose said he wanted to renovate it. Day, 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 day Taylor. House. So there's another component of this, and that is that when I was in the third year of architecture school, our project was to design the replacement structures in the Congress Street, in the project that Tyler is talking about. Um, and we build a model of that whole part of Hartford. Wow. And I remember building the model out of cardboard of the Church of the Good Shepherd <laughs> and, the, and the parish house. So in about 1961 or two, so instead of demolishing the neighborhood and God knows what would have been built, um, it is there, and if you want to know what was there, you can go down the street today and see what was there, because it's still there. There's just always a fight, you know, to preserve things that, that, uh, that didn't originate yesterday. The other kind of force at work here was the whole Interstate Highway Act, and, I, I believe Robert Moses even came to Hartford at the request of the bishops and told them when they were talking about doing I-84, and he said, As when you're buying up the land there to do it, buy all that stuff on the north end and clear that out. Uh, at least 70, I think, of houses were, get rid of that blight. That's in the clay arsenal area. Robert Moses Clear the way for modernism. James Rouse, he got all of his financing from the insurance companies, I think mainly Connecticut General. So he was in Connecticut and he said, why don't you do what I'm doing down here? Sold them on the idea. The intention was not to build a new city, a new town, move all the Hispanics there. And under the egress of top-down planning, we're talking about doing something because we got to stem the riots. The riots happened in 66. Peter Labasi was involved. Bob Patricelli was invo involved. Really? So they were the one and two ahead of it. Uh, my father, at the end of Hartford process, was chairman. Uh, well, I, but I mean, I think too, it was somewhat represented by the Phoenix building, the notion of going, Hartford thought, we're going all in and on modern.
feel sometimes that Hartford, you know, the corporate community is t terrified by the idea of looking old and that they really feel like they're, they're, they're part of the image and the mindset of the culture needs to be future-oriented, progress, and that anything that smacks of history or looking backwards is against the grain of who they want to be. And, and that, that was the message that the Chamber of Commerce, Arthur Lumsden in particular, it was his vision that somehow the corporate Hartford would make it possible for Hartford to become a kind of little paradise. Yeah. And that meant actually supporting the arts. And uh, he and I got put on a, a task force in the Chamber of Commerce, which was called the Hartford Beautification Task Force. And we were so horrified that everybody was talking about, well, you make Hartford beautiful by getting a lot of concrete platters, and you fill them with flowers in the spring, and you keep them in water down the street. Yeah. And then Hartford will be beautiful. And Tom and I, uh, Dow and I said, this is ridiculous. The money should be spent doing more about the great architecture that's sitting here unused and unappreciated. But what are some of the buildings that were on that list? Oh, well, of course, the Cheney Building, the H.H. H. Richardson, the old state, uh, the state capitol, um, the Athenaeum, uh, the, it's sort of, well, in Trinity College and, yeah, yeah, and of the course. parish of the Church of the Good Shepherd. Well, remember Mark Twain. Uh, made an observation about Hartford being the most beautiful city in the country. Yeah. Because we don't believe it, you know. We think, how did Mark Twain tell a white fib like that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think one of the great achievements, when the Hartford Architecture Conservancy was founded, there were 12 buildings on the National Register. And Jar just named half of them. When Tony Gold left in, what would it be? 86. 86. There were 4,000 buildings listed on the National wow. Register, either in dis mostly in districts, and that really allowed all those buildings to be eligible for historic tax credits. A, a landscape without landmarks is man without memory. Those 4,000 buildings are the memory. To get tax credits to do it, it it's, it's been the engine that has, I think, really kept us in the game. It's a good thing, the tax credits gave economic reality and, and momentum to something that was already happening. And the, the downside, the preservation industrial complex, there was this stigma about little old ladies in tennis shoes, you know, and it was really trashing the women that started this whole yeah. enterprise. And I, I have a problem with that. But they're, not only were their hearts in the right place, they really got why it matters. Conservancy and its resources paid for this survey to be completed. Well, no, it was in initiated under Tyler. But uh, the, the, he the heavy lifting, I mean, we got it started, kind of was launched in volume one. And, That's volume and, and one. Merle Kummer, who was for, for Tony Gold, who was just wonderful. And, and Cook, and Cook Row. Uh, Where did the Hartford Architecture Conservancy, where did they get the money? We got a, I, think, ambitious. I think we got uh, some money from the uh, through Jack Shanahan. The tax credit projects is, and probably did get taken over by developers. 1,400 apartments have been renovated. They're all rental. Uh, HUD used to have programs that were directed towards home ownership that kind of uh, played into the revolving fund where an existing homeowner could get a loan from HUD, renovate his place, and stay in it. And yet, in my opinion, most of the heavy lifting of preservation happens uh, one building at a time by people like you that have a historic house who we make sacrifices for it. We spend money on it. When we fix things, we do it respectful and responsive to what it was. That home ownership um, has a benefit. You buy low and you can sell high. And it was always an opportunity for people to buy, buy with borrowed money and eventually pay off the, the loan, own the property so that it was a principal asset if, when they left the, this earth. Well, there's something going back to the city movement in the 70s and yeah, 80s. Yeah. And so if you look at um, uh, Charter Oak Place, right. yeah. all those 
Howard, Howard Nannan and company renovated them and then sold them. We, we did all those buildings. Remember when found J.P. Morgan's yes, uh, initials carved in the cupola down wow. at the end? It, the brownstones on Capitol Avenue in Buckingham yes. were half of them vacant, and Tom Tremont took over the oil and, and, and then Fixed sold them, them off. And so that, that was a whole program that was renovating building by building, selling them, and, and, and it worked. But a lot of it was done by small developers who would do a building and sell two. The, in, and then maybe do another? And then do and the next one and do the next one and, and, and sell them off as they went. And a Conservancy board member who was a professor of law, this is talking about Terry Tondra, sure. um, who became the wizard here because I think he personally became so passionate about this that he um, caused the legislation to be written that ultimately was passed by the state uh, government that put all of these tax credit uh, formulas yeah. on the books. He made it abundantly clear that what his area of expertise was was finance, real estate finance. and finance. And, yeah, yeah. and that may be what the world needs, but it, the idea it would be like a Catholic priest that really didn't believe in God. I mean, how do you, how do you, <laughs> how do you, uh, do we're talking about is a passion for the building uh, and its origins and its history and and its influence on the way we live. And, and you know, my, Michael Kursky, not to pick on him, but oh, do. epitomized um, the, the qualities that I'm, tr I'm troubled by. He, you know, I'm sure he regarded me as a insignificant antiquarian with uh, uh, unbusinesslike interests. Brought the whole thing down. I mean, I mean he basically sold his soul to making deals with developers. Yeah. This right. play, this was an engine that was running, it was purring. Yeah. There was nothing like it in Massachusetts, there was nothing like it in New Hampshire or Vermont or Maine, uh, Rhode Island was the only exception. And look, Christine loved her work there, uh, thought highly of Tony Gold, the... Um, totally. Uh, she, you know, her job, she was hired as the educator to put out the newsletter to do programs and activities, she was good at it, she loved it. And they were doing that stuff. And the word you use, title of placemaking, it's a complicated art. And Kip was trying to change things at, at the Culture and Tourism Agency and to try to get the arts and the museums and the tourism people and the preservation people sort of accountable to one another and to think of these activities as interrelated, which is not really rocket science, mm -hmm. but boy, has it been hard. The, ultimate goal is to have a multifaceted perspective about the betterment of places. Because Larson's pretty pretty high up on some of the appropriations committee. Rosa DeLauro is head of appropriations. Yes. God help us. Yeah, I know, but hold on. The, the, the Buttigieg is Luke Bronin's best friend. Oh, so the stars what? are aligned. You could ever I come up with a strategy to connect North Hartford to the city. It's a short walk. Sure. Is there, are there things that one could do yes. to, uh, even in the way of landscaping, little things? See, that, that I-84 is over a football field wide. Yeah, I'm interested in Categories. how uh, one launches an architectural practice. Uh, and getting clients is not always easy, and particularly if you have a vision for what you want to do. Uh, you, you might find it hard to sell that. So. When Smith Edwards got started, what were, what were some other things made you feel like, hey, we're going somewhere? I do, I do think we were one of the very first firms into adaptive reuse. I think that has been a significant component of our work. And in 79, we did Billings Forge, which it converted that into 100 apartments. It was the first mill conversion uh, done in, in Hartford. At the time, it was a tax credit project, and it was uh, it was pretty wonderful. Okay, so the point about Signal was what? They wanted to tear the, the whole thing down, and it was all run out of the real estate department, who was seeing the advantages of developing the whole site into yeah. like their housing. And she arranged for Dick Moe to come up. Yeah. 
And so this big powwow was scheduled with all the heavyweights. And Cigna said, well, we might be willing to consider doing this and that, but we're tearing down the Royer building behind it. And, and Mo said, no, you aren't. Over my dead body, you're tearing that building down. And all the faces go red, and it was a stare down. I thought the Cigna guy was going to come over the table <laughs> to go at Mo. You don't tear it down, and we'll say nothing more about the other building. Does Cigna still own the building? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And Which they is... got $11 million in tax benefits. And Anderson Nodder, they were the ones who came in, actually, and saved the New London Railroad Station. And they were doing historic preservation architecture first. American cathedrals, i.e. its factories. Yeah. Bruner Cott did the first conversion of, as a developer, owner-developer of, of a mill in Winooski, Vermont, just north of Burlington. And I remember going up to see that. That would have been in 1978. And it was just stunning. It was great to see what they did and what they could do with the building. Interestingly enough, in 1979, uh, Billings Forge, well, it was a wreck. And, uh, and nobody knew what to do with it. And it's, we were pushing for the conversion of that into housing. And we put together a team and uh, we got the job. And that was the first mill conversion done in Hartford. It was a tax act project and it followed uh, Hack's successful stopping of the uh, urban renewal initiative in the South Green. Um, and it, to me, paved the way for what we did in 84, which was the Aetna Capital Avenue work. The state of Connecticut uh, Public Works um, asked us to um, take on the old Phoenix Mutual on Elm Street, right? because that's the first time the state of Connecticut was looking to buy a, a building and rehabbing it into a state office building. And Billy DeBella uh, was a $5,000 Feasibility study. Uh, it may be that the, the architectural schools hadn't given much thought to this either. No. Um, we felt very strongly contemporary architecture could be inserted into period buildings and they could be done in ways that were very um, uh, quiet and didn't disrupt the integrity of the original building. The fact that you used contemporary design in as well as restoring elements of the original, um, wasn't what people were thinking. Anderson Nodder uh, had demonstrated also that taking a building and rehabbing it, um, you could build up the quality of the original uh, by making repairs, but then you could introduce new elements. Lee in uh, Norwich at that Ponema mill, and it's just breathtaking. Yeah. And, and it, right in my backyard, practically, in Windsor Locks, the old Montgomery factory s sat there for 25, almost 30 years, just like with pigeons. What, the oldest section burned like 10, 15 years ago. And I said, this is just, this is all going to end badly. Well, like 95% occupancy in one year. And it's right next to the railroad tracks. I joked about it being beachfront property because it's right on the Connecticut River. But, I don't know, it's great. I'm glad it you know, got saved. But I... yeah, that, that building was 600 feet long uh, and had, had some annex buildings. It was huge and we, we got all the construction documents done to convert it into a, 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 a apartments and a sports center and all of this. And I mean, I think I might have been in East Hartford, if not Manchester, and I see this big black cloud. cloud. Horrible. And I, I went right to it. It was a fire. Oh, yeah. Burned to the ground, and uh, an investigation was not done. It started uniformly down the central hallway, 600 feet long, at one moment. Somebody had walked down with a gas can down the full length of that and set that match off. Do you, do, do you think of the Royal Typewriter Factory? I said, oh yes we do. Now this would have been Thursday afternoon and it's Sunday morning, the place was in flames. Do you think that project, had it gone forward, would have been successful? Uh, 
the new buildings make fabulous the character and the quality and the kind of muscularity of them. I, I mean, they're just wonderful. Certainly the great satisfaction of my professional life here is the cult conversion. I played a minor role in jump-starting public interest in it, but the fact that it got done and it took three or four developers failing yeah. before the one finally got it done. When we, I was at the Athenaeum, our son was in daycare at the Church of the Good Shepherd, and I'd go down every lunch and hang out with him. So I spent a lot of time um, just examining the setting and thinking about it. And it, it, it's, a, I, you know, it's a, what is it, a six-minute walk from the Athenaeum? I mean, it's not, it seems like it's out there in the Dakotas, but it's really not. It's, yeah. it, it's pretty much downtown. Well, when the um, Athenaeum had that uh, Gothic to Goth, goth uh, exhibition yeah, yeah. about five years ago, um, I did an architectural tour which began with the Gothic of Wadsworth Athenaeum's original building, the 1843 building, and we walked to the Church of the Good Shepherd uh, and walked back. And it, Tom Standish yeah. did Americana, the restaurant there. Yes. That was big that it got done because next screw factory and which is attached or next, next door. Next yeah. door. Yes. And then and then the, I mean it all started to make sense down there with the Atlantic Screw Factory being done now, which is great. You know, faced with a choice between adaptive reuse and demolition and new construction, isn't it just always easier to demolish and build a new? It is, but the other driving force was uh, get these vacant buildings off the tax rolls by demolishing them. That's why we have all the surface parking. Tom Conner wrote for years about this, they ought to be taxed to their potential. When you remove them, they're tax the, the, the value is reduced to a surface parking lot. Oh. I mean, all of the demolition you see downtown, Hilton, it's all the buildings on Allen Street, on the north side, it was uh, the Little Etna building. I mean, go on and on. It's rare for a community to have a nuanced, sort of preservation-oriented vision of their own future. Most places don't. I'm guessing that maybe places like Portsmouth, New Hampshire did, but Hartford had already destroyed so much to get the city to take tourism seriously. Don't think Hartford's very interesting. Uh, themselves, you know, as a historic place. We're sitting on a gold mine. Be two years before I moved here, I watched Bill Foudy dazzle an audience in Philadelphia with the stories of Mark Twain, and I thought, well, Hartwood is, flies a little under the radar. Uh, I want to learn more. And uh, James Marston Fitch, at the first public meeting of the Conservancy at the Historical Society, Fitch pointed out... Northam uh, Chapel. Well, chapels at cemeteries were constructed because they were the place for funeral rites. In the pre-automobile age, if you got yourself to the cemetery gate, there was a chapel there, you could have a funeral service in the chapel, and you could follow the cortege into the cemetery to the burial. Uh, was, was the Northam Chapel a, a George Keller? Uh, the whole complex there, the gate, the gateway with the two small gate houses and the chapel were all part of a design that Keller made for the Cedar Hill Cemetery. Wow. The chapel been, had been abandoned for maybe 40 or 50 years. It was maintained, but it had some serious uh, roof problems and flashing problems, and most of the work actually was hidden because it was walls were saturated with water and it was in rather poor structure. Was it being used for anything? No, it was not being used for anything. They wanted to turn it into an office that could service um, the customers of the cemetery. And so it was uh, basically made into a contemporary um, open office space, um, taking out the pews and setting up workstations, etc. But it enabled them to re, well, restore the building, um, repair all the damage, and make a, an attractive large space in which they could do the did, did Talk about uh, the Ninth Square. And the Ninth Square. We, That's which, a huge project. Which was a very big project we did in 1995. Ninth Square was basically 
uh, kind of more of a manufacturing zone that had died on the vine and the buildings were vacant. There was nothing there. And so we teamed up with uh, Herb Newman uh, and we were hired by the Cormac Baron out of St. Louis uh, to do 13 buildings that were interconnected as, in Knight Square to renovate those and Herb Newman, was, there was a vacant site, was going to do a six-story housing. Yeah. Significant uh, initiative on the part of New Haven and, and it's been a great success. It was always envisioned retail on the first floor. The apartments went pretty quickly as rental units. And we had to do crazy things, connect buildings that, uh, in order to make the economics work of having an elevator in one building that could serve two. And this did get a national AIA award. Uh, we did the exchange building. Ithiel Town Building was on the corner of church and chapels. Yeah. Um, basically defaced by neglect. Um, in the 20th century, and what we discovered is that actually there was a small rotunda on the roof that that corner um, had been a project that Ithiel Town had to build a bank. And they built uh, just a purpose-built uh, group of walk-up shops and, and a retail building. And there was one lawyer who refused to leave the building uh when we started construction. From a construction standpoint, that was probably one of the most amazing things we did because it was a wood frame building that had a brick veneer. We used the existing wooden frame, we poured concrete floors on the top floor, got them all in the columns located, went down a floor, and did poured the concrete floors over the existing, and then took that down and went down right, I mean, totally inverse. But do you need an engineer on a project like that to ascertain that what you're going to do will succeed? Well, the answer is yes. And the architects need lots of help. I mean, I mean, we need structural engineers, we need mechanical engineers, we need... Uh, 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 we're mostly the, the ringmaster. Yeah, the George Cooper, my um, mentor, art historian at Yale, he said, he said, you architect are like the conductors of an orchestra. He said, you've got a cast of 20 or 30 professionals all working under your direction. And you keep them all in line and you end up with a performance. Of course, the old state house. One of the, one of the key um, ingredients in the success of that project, that the building should be treated um, to a conservation rather than a restoration or a rehab. Or Involved in the, the underground yes. facility. So does John have a process when, when that happens? That you've checked the boxes and you don't just say yes to something if it doesn't meet X, Y, and Z conditions. Well, in the, in the case of the old state house, it was critical to have all of those boxes checked before anything, uh, before a shovel was in the ground, so to speak. So that that stopped people from making changes during the course of the project. Even Fabi. Even <laughs> I mean, that, which um, actually was, a, to my knowledge, a first, deciding that the exterior of the building would remain as it was changed in 1924 is a Georgian Revival 1924 restoration of the old state house. Yeah. Has some very elaborate um, columns in the courtroom that were built in 1924. That's not the way the building appeared in 1796. Upstairs, the legislative chamber, um, there was no evidence of what the original decorations in that room were. Replicate the original um, 19, excuse me, 1874 uh, decorations, and that signified that the legislature had moved from the old state house to the new capital. And the city of Hartford decorated that room uh, as the new council chamber. And then the piece de, piece de resistance really was the Senate space, which when we did the scrapings, we discovered the original saffron yellow wall color in that room and the original paint color of the trim. That was not altered, so that that was it, the original chamber and we were able to restore its appearance. So you had different periods in different rooms, 
and I suggest that um, in 1996, when that building opened, it was the first historic building that was restored to an exterior that was a total different than the interiors and the rooms from room to room. Here so the whole history of the building yeah. is in the way that the interiors were treated. Bowdy's masterpiece really was the Stewards Museum up in the attic there. <laughs> I mean, what, what it, it, just an unexpected triumph. Had to start with, the surviving um, objects from Stewards Museum were in the Connecticut Historical Society's collection. And so you start with the original collection. And then there were elements that were missing, but Fowdy's researchers had found ads in the Hartford Current of Stewards Museum, and they had stuffed leopards, and they had all sorts two -headed of... Two-headed calf. And the two-headed calf, <laughs> all of that. So yeah, the big problem with the state capitol is still a problem, and that is it was built with very poor quality marble. The question was, how long is the marble going to remain um, durable enough? And you'll see it's all breaking apart, and instead of crisp and really highly polished edges, uh, they're all soft and they're, they're as it were, exfoliated. Well, Good Shepherd, how did your involvement there begin? Uh, at the Hartford Architect Conservancy, we had a newsletter, and the first newsletter came out and it had a little paragraph saying that it was possible that um, might have to tear the church down because it was quite irritated that this um, appeared in the Hack Newsletter. There was a wonderful um, uh, rector of Church of Good Shepherd named James Kowalski. Um, loved the building because the National Trust was having a, a number one a conference called Sacred Places in Boston. Spent two days at this uh, seminar and he was all pumped to really do a job at the Church of the Good Shepherd. I mean, he saw the light, as it were. I think it was in the 1990s yeah. that we did the, a lot of restoration in the parish house right. where lead windows were collapsing um, all sorts of problems, and we were able to re reverse all of that. I mean, I think that parish house, to me, the most glorious space mm -hmm. in the city. Yeah. Well, what's so interesting about that building, it, of course, it's Edward Tuckham Potter, same architect mm -hmm. as the Mark Twain house, but Mrs. Colt was also very fond of Potter, who she had commissioned to do an interior of one of the rooms at Armsmere, to, as a memorial to Sam when he died. And Potter's father was an Episcopal bishop, and Potter's uncle was an Episcopal bishop, one of the state of New York, the other of the state of Pennsylvania. So Potter was just up Mrs. Colt's alley. And then when Mrs. Colt guaranteed Samuel Clemens $150,000 loan to build the house on Farmington Avenue, Guess who the architect was? Edward Tuckerman Potter, who Mrs. Colt had obviously met in Newport, because the Potter brothers also summered in Newport with yeah. Mrs. Colt.